Hey everybody, welcome to week 7 of PS231. Week 7, has it already been se- It's hard to believe, right? Um, you know, every semester flies by, but I don't know, this one seems especially fly by Maybe it's because, I mean, and I know that time, time feels like it's moving very slowly. I don't know about you, this is how it's been for me. But then it also seems like it's moving very fast. The only thing that time doesn't seem like it's doing is flowing at a normal rate. Which is weird. But anyway, you've made it to week 7, which means that you know some game theory. You know how to do some game theory, which is exciting. And we're really getting into the core of the class. I think that it's hard in a 15-week class with technical material. Because there has to be some setup. And then there has to be some really cool applications toward the end. And you're like, oh, can we just get to the end, please? Eh, just be patient. You know, there's always some some cool things that happen at the end that you try to hint at, at, at what might be a, a deeper level of the class or the material. But in any class of 15 weeks, there's like a core part. And right now we are very much in that core part of this class. PS231 is a class in strategic models. And now we're talking very deeply about what a strategic model is and what it does and how we interact with it. And so, so in a sense, there's something tedious, right? So, so we covered sets. We, we took just one little, zing, we just took the top off of the, of all of the depth of sets. We looked at the top of the iceberg of sets and we looked at the top of the iceberg of functions. And we looked at the top of the iceberg of preference relations and expected utility theory. We looked at just enough of those things to be able to talk about what we're doing now. You know, this isn't a class in set theory. This isn't a class in utility theory or whatever. This is a class in strategic models. But then once we get to whatever the topic is, we're no longer so carefully curating what it is that we're talking about, right? So so I was very careful in what we talked about with sets, functions, logic, and with utility theory because I only wanted to choose those things that would be really helpful for us here. But now that we're to the core of the class, we can take our time. We can... I don't have to curate things so much because if I show you a random aside on something, it isn't random, right? It's about the thing that this class is ostensibly about. And so a a week like this one, a week about mixed strategies and mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, it's evidence of our leisurely pace here in the core. And so you might be thinking to yourself, oh, well, I'm not getting as much material because of this leisurely pace that we're moving at, or I'm not seeing as many applications as I would like to see. And, and, and that's true in both regards. And for that, mea culpa. But there's also something to be said for the osmosis. There's something to be said for the time that you spend staring at a, a doodle or a game and not understand it. That time that you spend staring and waiting for a little bit of inspiration whether it's about a doodle or whether it's about some application or whether it's about some deeper aspect, it isn't really the material that's teaching you. It's the time that you're spending. And I think that's an underappreciated part of learning. You know, learning isn't just about acquiring things. It's about staring at a piece of paper until you come to understand what's on it and not moving to the next piece of paper until you do. Now, because of time frames, we can't really be as leisurely, like, like that would be a, a maximally leisurely situation. And we can't do that because we have 15 weeks to work with. And we're almost halfway into the class. So, so there's only so much that we can wait for, for osmosis to happen. But I hope that you know that this is a choice on my part. This is a pedagogical choice on my part to say, let's move through the core of this class pretty slowly. Let's... Let's take our time. Let's be deliberate and enjoy these views that we've worked so hard. We've climbed so many mountains to get higher up the mountain. We're not to the top. But now that we're higher up the mountain, we can stop. We can look. We can say, hey, this is a beautiful view. And I want to spend some time looking at this view so that I can understand it. This is a a giant philosophical aside, and I'm really sorry about that. But I think it's important. I really do. More importantly, I hope that you learn it's okay to stare at something and not understand it. We all had better be okay with that because, you know, reality isn't getting any simpler just on our account. Staring and and waiting for, for osmosis to happen and being comfortable with that, not getting nervous, not getting flustered, being comfortable, 
In an academic sense, that is precisely confidence. Confidence isn't just knowing the things that you, that you know or the things that you think that you know. Confidence is being ready for whatever comes and having the humility to say, I don't understand that all the way just yet. And that's okay. But that's way better if you ask me. And this is just one person's opinion. That's way better if you ask me. And so I hope this leisurely pace is something, I don't know if it's something you're used to. I've never taken a class here before. So I don't know if this is if this is what you get accustomed to, but if you don't get a whole lot of that, um, then I hope that this is, if an uncomfortable change, uh, a useful one anyway. You're doing great. And I just, I started this, the thing that was in my head, I have no notes, but the thing that was in my head that, that got me started saying these things was how pleased I've been with, with so many of your approaches to this class, not just your, your performance. I can tell that many of you are, are staring at the page and waiting and, and working through and, and learning actively and doodling and, and trying to be a little bit creative or trying to see a different problem from a lot of different angles. Um, and I really appreciate that about you all. It doesn't make my job easier, but it does make it more fun. So the subject of today's lecture is, is we're going to dig deeper into mixed strategies. I'm going to call this Nash 2. Last week was Nash 1. So in the previous lecture, we, we dug very deeply into pure strategy Nash equilibrium. We thought about Nash equilibrium in, in two ways. The more definitional way is the way that's a little bit more helpful from an intuitive standpoint. So, so a Nash equilibrium, a pure strategy Nash equilibrium, is a vector of choices, right? So it's, it's, it's a choice made a pure strategy, where now you have some sense about what I mean by that. It's just a choice made. It's one out of the action set for every player. So it's an n-tuple of choices. Player one's choice, player two's choice, player three's choice, dot, dot, dot. Player n minus two's choice, player n minus one's choice, and player n's choice. And it's a profile that satisfies the interesting and intuitive property that no individual player has an incentive to unilaterally deviate. So if we find ourselves at one outcome, where everybody has made a choice, no one individual looks at that outcome and says, I wish I had done things differently now that I know what everybody else had done. So, so Nash equilibrium is sort of a, a stability thing. It's, it's, a, it's a state of affairs where nobody wants to change the outcome conditional on what everybody else did. That doesn't mean that you don't wish you could change the world. You might wish, hey, I'm at, I'm at defect effect. I wish I could change the world so that we cooperated, but Nash Equilibrium takes that individual incentive very seriously. It says, well, you, you don't get to change what column player did just because it helps you and it helps them. Column player is the one with the agency over which column we're in, so you don't get to change that if you're the row player. But in Matching Pennies, we learn that there are some games that don't have a pure strategy Nash Equilibrium, right? So in that example, it was precisely impossible to find a landing place because one player wanted to, to be in the same place at the same time and one player didn't want to be in the same place at the same time. So if we were at a place where they were in the same place, the person that wanted to not be together would, would deviate. And if we were in a state of affairs where they weren't together, the person that wanted to be together would deviate so that it's impossible to land anywhere. There's this giant cycle of behavior. But then there is no steady state, there is no equilibrium, there is no balance. Now that's fine. Maybe there are some situations that, that, that go that way, but we need to show up to our funding agency with some prediction in our mind. We need, to, we need to know that some kind of prediction exists. So we're going to have to elaborate on this logic of Nash Equilibrium, this logic of mutual best response, like we talked about in the B block of last week's lecture. We need to take that logic and extend it. We need to make that logic make sense for situations that are a little bit more random, a little bit more probabilistic, a little bit more uncertain, where the uncertainty is not aleatory uncertainty, but rather is uncertainty generated by the strategic incentives at work from the structure of the game. So that's what we're gonna talk about today. Along the way, we'll be able to reinforce some of the intuitions that you honed last week. We'll be able to, t we'll still talk about pure strategy Nash Equilibria, which are Nash Equilibria. It just will also be talking about their companions, the mixed strategy Nash Equilibria. And pure and mixed strategies, that, that's all the possible kinds. So we will, be, we will have exhausted Nash Equilibrium by the end of today's lecture. So I think mixed strategies are really interesting. The reason that they're interesting is that so many important situations 
are situations kind of like matching pennies, where, where there are directly opposed incentives. Something zero-summy is going on. Um, and in situations like those, the, the, the zero-sum structure of the, of the interaction oftentimes induces probabilistic play. It might be something like matching pennies, it might be penalty kicks or a baseball pitcher, um, it might be something tactical on, on a military battlefield. Regardless, that mixing is very interesting because you're, now you're officially, you're making a bet, right? So, so to play a strategy is to make a bet and to say, some of the time this might not work out, but I have to choose the, my right amount of risk. How much risk do I want to introduce? How, mu how much uncertainty am I prepared to introduce into this, into, into my interaction with the game if I'm one of the players? And that introduction of uncertainty introduces all sorts of interesting nuances. Now, this isn't a topic that really lends itself to, to, to deep substantive motivations, right? This is this will feel a little bit technical at parts, and so I'm not going to even try to tell you that this is life-changing. It's interesting, it's cool, it's in here for completeness sake, it, it's here to get you thinking about what mixing means in a substantive sense, but, but some parts of today's lecture might just feel a little bit flat, and for that I'm sorry. Uh, I can only be so exciting, as you know by now, I haven't been exciting yet, but I might even be a little bit less than usual, and for that I'm sorry. There's a lot of beauty in this, but it might be beauty that's most easily seen by a specialist. And, um, but I'm sure you're gonna do great. One upside of all of this is that because we have a nice book of fables to work with now, today's lecture will include lots of examples. So we'll be working through a lot of examples. We'll only introduce the rudiments in the A block and then the rest of the lecture will be about trying to reinforce that. There may be parts of the A block that you don't get the first time, which means for many of you, you won't get it because there's only gonna be a first time. There will be some parts that you don't get the first time, but if you go back after some of the examples, things might make sense a little bit more. This is this might be some windshield wiping going on here in terms of, of, of what works for you and what doesn't. It's going to be a tricky problem set the design too, and so I'm already apologetic about that. Let me stop apologizing and let's get to it. So in the A block, I want to talk about probabilistic best response. What do I mean by that? I mean, what is it to best respond with a lottery? How do I figure out which probabilities I would like to assign to each of my actions, conditional on my expectations about what probabilities you're assigning to each of your actions? That's already a heavy thing to think about, right? That's pretty exciting. So maybe I shouldn't have apologized so much. In the B block, I want to work through some examples. I just want to make sure that we, we I show you how to think deeply about not just the mixed strategy equilibria of a given game, but all of the equilibria. How do we think about how a game's equilibria move in response to the game moving a little bit. So if I set some sliders, if I change some utility sliders, for example, can I come up with some interesting changes in the equilibrium behavior? The answer is yes, which is nice. So we'll just work through a bunch of two by two examples. And then in the C block, I wanna work through one two by three example. We'll work through rock, paper, scissors, and that's only because I want to make sure that you have a sense about just how much complication mixing adds to the, to the equation. And then, of course, the problems that will involve even more wrinkles because that's just how we roll. I, I hope that things don't make sense to start, which is always a good bet. And then by the end, you'll feel like there's been some accumulation about what happened today. We'll have plenty of chance to practice, too. And I'm looking forward to many great questions for you, but from you. Before I issue any more apologies about how awful this lecture is going to be, why don't you, I let you be the judge about how awful this lecture is going to be, and why don't we just get started? So consider the game of matching pennies. Oh man, I'll never get tired of that. And it occurred to me while I was editing last week's movie that I missed an opportunity because it's like, oh. Now you see it, now you don't. Now you see it, now you don't. Now you see it, now you don't. I should make sure that we can see it for the, for the lecture, shouldn't I? Now you see it, and I put my hand down gingerly. So here's Matching Pennies. This is a game of anti-coordination. This is a game where um, the, the role player wants heads to be up in both coins or tails to be up in both coins, and the column player wants the opposite of that. They want, they want it to, to, to not be the same. So, so this is, you're at a wedding and you're trying to avoid somebody who really thinks that you're best friends. And you might remember from last week's lecture that this game has no pure strategy Nash equilibrium. Let's, let's do that just to, just to reinforce our intuitions. So I'm just going to do this with asterisk analysis. You can usually tell when the marker comes out that it's, I'm just going to put some stars on, on this game. 
So conditional on you having heads up, I wish that I had heads up. So I'm gonna put some stars there. Conditional on you having tails up, that's over here. Conditional on you having tails up, I wish that I had tails up. So I'm gonna put a little asterisk next to the one that I would get if I had tails up. How about you? Well, conditional on being in the heads row, you wish that you had tails up. So I'm gonna put a, a little star next to the one that you could get if you had tails up. And then finally, uh, conditional on me being in the tails row, you wish that you were in the heads column. So I'm gonna put a little one there next to the one that you could get. And lo and behold, there is no intersection of the best response correspondence, at least in this pure strategy space that we have, right? There is no, there is no one profile, heads, 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 tails, tails, heads, or tails, tails. There is no one profile out of the four possible pure strategy profiles. No single pure strategy profile has two stars in it. So, so there is no stable landing point in pure strategies in this game, right? Which means that if we, if, if the funding agency handed us this game and said, make some predictions, as of right now, we have nothing to go on. Okay. Now, if you remember the C block of last week's lecture, we talked about some probabilistic play. We said, what happens if the players choose probabilities over their possible outcome? So instead of just choosing heads or choosing tails, you say, I'm going to have heads up P percent of the time. I'm going to have tails up one minus P percent of the time, right? And so let's think about what happens if column player mixes, I'm gonna call their probability Q because I'm gonna use P for row player, you'll see. So, so let's suppose the column player, instead of choosing heads or tails for sure, mixed, right? They're gonna play a mixed strategy, which reads in their action set, it reads in their possible choices, and it spits out a probability vector that says, I'm gonna play that option some of the time. I'm gonna play that option some of the time, and so on. Here it's very straightforward because you only have to choose one mixing probability. So let's say that column player plays heads with probability Q. And that means that they play tails with probability one minus Q. Notice that if Q was one, this would be a pure strategy of playing heads. You'd be playing heads with probability one, which is just choosing heads. And if Q was zero, then this would be equivalent to playing the pure strategy tails, okay? However, Q could be one half, three quarters, one quarter, one over pi. It could be any number in between zero and one, inclusive. And so this gives us a, a, a somewhat richer way to think about what column player is doing. Notice also that it's less discrete. Before it was like you go heads or you go tails. Now it's you're choosing something out of a continuum right? There's some range of possible outcomes between zero and one. So you're choosing out of, out of this newly connected space. That, that's what they're called. Continuous space, right? We just took a really discrete choice. Go to the left or go to the right. Play heads or play tails. We took that choice, which seemed really separated, and we've made it something a little bit smoother. And that actually, we're not gonna get into the mathematics of this, but that actually plays a big part in the math. Okay, so let's think about row players expected utilities for playing heads and playing tails, given the expectation the column player will play heads Q with probability Q. Let's think about their expected utility of heads and their expected utility of tails, all right? Well, so the expected utility of playing heads for row player in, ex in expectation of Q being the probability that, that column player plays heads. I just feel like this is a week just fraught with peril in terms of me having even more malapropisms than usual. There should be some giant list of all of Rob's malapropisms, which I'm sure would be a very, very long and depressing list. Again, that you'd think that that would mean that I would script these? No. Why would I script them? then they would make sense and be coherent. This is way better. All right, so let us that means we gotta work through this row. Now, these are both lotteries, just like we had before. So what we're saying now is playing heads is a lottery. Why is it a lottery? Because column player has created uncertainty. Column player's mixing, or potential for mixing, creates uncertainty for row player about what to expect if they, if they go heads or if they go tails. 
Basically, Rogue Player is choosing between some lotteries, the Heads Lottery and the Tails Lottery. What are the expected utilities of those two lotteries? Well, let's think about the Heads Lottery first. Okay? Well, with probability Q, they're in the world where Column Player played Heads. And if they played Heads, then they're really happy. They get a whole happiness point. So it's Q times 1, right? Plus... Well, there's w the probability of being in the tails world is one minus Q times the sad outcome because now they're in the heads row, but the tails column, that means row player is very sad. So that's one minus Q times minus one. So we have Q times one plus one minus Q times minus one. And if you work that all out, that's two Q minus one. Before I go further, check out, this is really cool. This is really cool. Cons consider the situation where Q was equal to, to 1. Chewie says hi. Consider the situation where Q was equal to 1. Well, if Q was equal to 1, which is to say, column player was playing heads for sure, then playing heads would offer row player expected utility. It would offer row player expected utility 2Q minus 1. Well, if Q was 1, that would be 2 times 1 minus 1, which is just 1, which is exactly what they had in that cell to begin with. Similarly, if Q was equal to 0, we would be in the tails column for sure, Well, and the expected utility of playing heads would be 2Q minus 1, just like before, but it would be 2 times 0 minus 1, which is 0 minus 1, which is minus 1, which is exactly what we got in the cell. So this expected utility of heads that we're talking about right now, that expected utility, we see the special cases that you would get if Q was equal to zero or Q was equal to one so that there wasn't any uncertainty. It would, they would just be the, the utility numbers that we have in the cell to begin with. However, for any other Q, if Q was equal to a half, for example, then the expected utility would be two times one half is one, Minus one is, is zero. So I can hit a different range of expected utilities for playing heads conditional on different Qs. Be that Q be zero, one, one half, one third, one quarter, three quarters, seven eighths, a Google minus one over a Google, and so on. Okay, let's work out this tails expected utility. Well, with probability Q, we're in the tails row and the heads column, that makes that means minus one for row players. So, so Q times minus one plus, well, one with, with probability one minus Q, we're in the tails tails. That's, that makes them happy. So, so that's one. So it's Q times minus one plus one minus Q times one, which works out to one minus two Q. So let's think about what row players best response to this Q is, all right? What should they do in response? Well, they should choose heads if the expected utility of heads is greater than the expected utility of tails. Which is to say, if 2q minus 1 is greater than or equal to 1 minus 2q. And if you work all that out, if you do some high school algebra, you, you see that that's if q is greater than or equal to 1 half. So if you think that they're going to go to heads more than half the time, then you should go heads, right? That, that means that you get the benefits of coordination at heads more than half the time, which more than outweighs the fact that you might sometimes wind up with the tails. Similarly, if Q was less than or equal to one half, then row players should go tails because they're going to be getting the benefits from the tails tails outcome more than half the time, which outweighs the minus one that they get for that Q percent of the time that they're stuck with in the, in the tails heads world. However, notice that at Q equals one half, if Q equals one half, then two Q minus one is zero and one minus two Q is zero. And so, in fact, row player is indifferent. Row player is indifferent if Q equals one half. They don't care if they play heads or tails. They're exactly indifferent between the two. Okay? Those expected utilities are equal if Q equals one half. If it were true that, that column player was mixing with exactly probability one half, 
then role player wouldn't care. Now let's think about enriching role player's world a little bit. Let's suppose that we were thinking about role player's best responses not in terms of go heads or go tails, but instead choose a probability of going heads, just like column player might be doing to, to generate this cue. So suppose that role player played heads with probability P. Let's let P be the probability that they choose heads. So if Q was strictly greater than one half, let's say that Q was strictly greater than one half. What's the best P that row player could choose? What's the best P that they could choose? Well, they would choose the P that got them in heads all the time because we just said that if Q is strictly greater than one half, then the expected utility of heads is strictly greater than the expected utility of tails. So that would mean set P equals to one for sure. Similarly, if Q was strictly less than one half, then that would mean that, that row player would like to be in tails world all the time. So they would set P equals to zero so that they were playing tails as a pure strategy. However, if Q was exactly equal to one half, exactly equal, if Q was exactly equal to one half, then it wouldn't matter what P was chosen. You could choose P equals zero and, and, and play tails for sure. You could choose P equals one and play heads for sure. You could choose P equals one half. It wouldn't matter because these expected utilities are exactly the same. So in other words, if Q was equal to one half, then any P would be best. Any P would be best. This is important. So if row player is precisely indifferent over heads and tails, then they would be willing to, 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 to mix over the two. If they weren't, if there wasn't that indifference, then there wouldn't be any reason to mix. One would be strictly better than the other. So I'm gonna write capital B sub one for row player of Q. I'm gonna say, what's the best response? It reads in a Q and it spits out the best P. So in this B sub one of Q, this is gonna spit out the probability that makes role player happiest in response to that Q. This is the best response. This is the best, this is me putting an asterisk except I don't have a finite number of columns to put an asterisk on. I'm gonna to try to find the best P out of this range of possible probabilities the row player could play with. Well, that means this is gonna be defined piecewise, right? Because it depends on what Q is. So B sub one of Q equals zero if Q is less than one half, strictly less than one half. So if, if I think that it's not very likely that you're gonna go heads, then I'm gonna play tails all the time. And in order to play tails all the time, I set P equals to zero, which means that one minus P equals one, and I'm always playing tails. Similarly, if Q is strictly greater than one half, then I want to play heads all the time. So I'm going to set P equals to one. But if Q is exactly equal to one half, then any P will render row player indifferent. They're all the same. They're all the same. So I can just choose the entire zero one interval, all the numbers, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So that's that's the best response. That is row player's best response to any cue. So you give me a cue, and this is the best thing that row player can do in response. Let's work out column player's expected utilities as a function of P, the probability that row player plays heads. So if the, the expected utility for playing the heads column, if you're column player, well, P with probability P, row player played heads, which means that you get a minus one. So that's P times minus one, plus one minus P times the one that you would get for, for anti-coordination. So that's P times minus one, plus one minus P times one. That works out to one minus two P. Now, what if they chose the tails column? Well, with probability P, they get the one point for anti-coordination. So that's P times one plus one minus P times minus one, that's two P minus one. So somewhat predictably, column player, if, if P is sufficiently high, if they think that heads is sufficiently likely, they want to play tails. And if they think that heads is sufficiently unlikely, they want to play heads. They're, remember, they're trying to avoid row player. Well, when are they indifferent? Well, they're indifferent exactly when P equals one half for the same exact logic as we talked about with row player. 
So I can work out B sub two column player's best response to any given P, right? I can work out that as best response to any given P. So if P is sufficiently high, if P is strictly greater than one half, then that means set Q to zero. Try to avoid them, play tails. If P is less than one half, which is to say if row player is playing tails more often than heads, then play heads by setting Q equals to one. And if P is exactly equal to one half, then you're indifferent. All the Qs give you the same exact expected utility. So now I have these two best response correspondences. They read in, a, they read in the other player's probability and they spit out my best probability. An interesting question is, when do those intersect? When is it the case that the probability that I'm choosing is a best response to yours and yours is a best response to mine? That's equilibrium. So if I can find a P that's a best response to the Q that's the best response to the P, then I'm good. It'll be easiest to see this graphically. So I'm gonna make a square. I'm gonna make a square and this is gonna be PQ space. So the horizontal axis is going to be player one's mixing probability, P. And the vertical axis is gonna be player two's mixing probability, Q. This is something you can do when it's two players and two choices. And I'm gonna mark, for reasons that are probably obvious right now, I'm gonna mark in advance P equals one half and Q equals one half in this, in this space. Those are gonna be the, really the, where the magic happens here. Let's plot player one's best response, which is to say it reads in a Q and it spits out the best P. So there are three regions of Q that we need to think about, right? Because remember the, 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 the best responses that we've defined are all defined in three parts. The one where it's unlikely, the one where it's likely, and the one where it's just right that render you indifferent. If Q is less than one half, then we know that row player wants us at P equal to zero. So for all of the values of Q less than one half, Right, that's right here. That's right here. That's south of this line. That's south of that 50-50 line. South of that 50-50 line, row player wants to set P equal to zero. So I can just draw a vertical line right up that axis. If Q is if Q is low enough, row player just wants to just zoom all the way to the all the way to the western frontier of this particular graph. Similarly, if Q is strictly greater than one half, then that means that row player would like to set P equal to one. So I got to I got to dance all the way over to the other side. And now I've got just a vertical line because for all of those probabilities that are greater than one half, three quarters, seven eighths, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So for every one of those probabilities, the best response P is one, but at exactly Q equals one half at exactly this line, any one of those would do. Any, any probability, whether it's zero, one, or anything in between would render row player indifferent. So I can just draw a horizontal line right at Q equals one half. All right? So we wind up with this kind of zhing, zhing, zhing. You know, it's just like a bunch of, of turns, right? Boom, boop, boop. Most of the time, there is no ambiguity about what row player would like to do. Most, you know, so for most of the cues, so for most of the cues, for almost all of the cues, any cue that isn't one half, for any cue that isn't one half, row player knows exactly what they want to do. Right? Row player wants to be in one of these two regions. But at exactly at the one special magic spot of Q equals one half, zoom, any P will do. Now let's think about this from column player's perspective. And again, there are three different kinds of P that we need to think about. Strictly less than one half, strictly greater than one half, and exactly one half, that one magic spot where they're indifferent, where column player is indifferent. That's just the right P. That's the P that makes column player indifferent, no matter what column player does. So if P is strictly greater than one half, then we're far this way. Well, from our best response correspondence, that's exactly when column player would like to set Q low. They want to set Q equals to zero, right? So, so down here, I've got a little horizontal line. I've got a horizontal line on the horizontal axis that goes all the way from P equals one, all the way to P equals one half, right? And if P is, is low, if P is strictly less than one half, 
Well, that's exactly when Colin Player would like to jump up and start and, and set their Q equals to one, right? And so up here, there's a horizontal line. There's a horizontal line up here at exactly Q equals one in response to any one of these low P's. If P is strictly less than one half, jump up to one. But if P is exactly equal to one half, if they're right in this middle line, I'm sure I'm missing everything. Just, just take, take the aim with a grain of salt, as you learned last week from the coordination game. So, but I can draw this vertical line at, at P equals one half, any Q will do. Any Q will do. So we wind up with, they don't intersect, notice, notice that there are no intersections that involve Q equals zero, Q equals one, P equals zero, or P equals one, which is to say the corners, there are no intersections at the corners of this square. This square has no intersections at the corners. This best response correspondence never crosses at one of the corners. There are no pure strategy Nash equilibria in this game, as we already knew. This is, that's a graphical depiction. The fact that we never hit a corner, each one of these corners is a pure strategy profile, right? There's the zero, zero profile, that's tails, tails, right? The one, one is, is heads, heads, right? I, I'll mark all these corners. Those are all the pure strategy profiles, but inside the square is all these possible mixing areas. There is an intersection though. There is an intersection right in the middle of the square. At one half, one half, P equals one half, Q equals one half. Heads half the time, tails half the time for both players, right? Row player plays heads half of the time, column player plays heads half the time. This is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. This intersection represents a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So even though this, we, 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 we couldn't show up to the funding agency, with the pure strategy Nash equilibrium. But we have a prediction. In the game of matching pennies, you put up heads half the time. That's pretty cool. That's pretty cool. I think it's pretty cool anyway. So this is your first example of a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Now, for completeness sake, let me tell you something important. For, and this is the reason that it's called Nash Equilibrium, was the fact that this theorem was first proved by John Nash. Here it is. Every game with a finite number of players, where every player has a finite number of alternatives, so if there's a Googleplex players, and every one of them has a Googleplex number of alternatives, that's still finite. But here it's two by two, it could be many. Many players, many actions available to each of them, but a finite number. So if that's the situation, so if we have a finite number of players and a finite number of actions for each player, then there always exists at least one Nash equilibrium, be it in pure or mixed strategies. That's a very important result because it means that we never show up to the agency empty handed for a very broad set of games. Any finite number of players, any finite number of alternatives. So that's great. It's a little bit tedious, but what we're getting here is some opportunity for bluffing, right? Some opportunity for mixing it up, some opportunity for strategic uncertainty. The fact that these players have such conflicting incentives introduces some wrinkles that mean that we never get to see a pure strategy play out. But that doesn't mean that there isn't a stable point, it's just that, that stable point is itself probabilistic. It's a stable set of probabilities. So you'd see collections of heads, and if we played this game a bunch of times, Sometimes it'd be heads, heads, sometimes it'd be heads, tails, sometimes it'd be tails, heads, sometimes it'd be tails, tails. How often? One quarter of the time it would be heads, heads. One half times one half. One quarter of the time it would be heads, tails. One half, one half. One quarter of the time it would be tails, heads. And one quarter of the time it would be tails, tails. So we know the probabilities then. We never know what any given instantiation of the game is going to turn up. You know, one instance of the game, we can't tell you for sure what will happen, but we can tell you what will happen in the long run in expectation using these probabilities. You can have stability that is still stochastic. That's interesting when you think about it. A stable set of random outcomes. That's the world. 
<laughs> Welcome. So that's mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. What's a formal definition? Oh, this is gonna be a pain. I'm only doing this for completeness sake. This is a pain. Just get used to it. I'm not gonna do this every time, but I have to tell you this. I have to tell you a formal definition of mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. Otherwise somebody will find me. My old game theory professors will find me. You don't, we don't want that. So here's what I'm gonna do. I need some, I need some additional notation. So for, for any given player, let's have a I, let's have a sub I be player I's action set. We'll, we'll assume that's finite for now. A sub I. Left, right, up, down, heads, tails, something bigger, rock, paper, scissors. There's all sorts of different action sets like me. It's just finite. Bakker Stravinsky, Swerver Straight, all the ones you've seen up to this point. So a mixed strategy for player I, I'm gonna call that Sigma I. So I'm gonna call that little Sigma I. Oh my God, this is so tedious. Little Sigma I is a function and it's gonna read in all of the possible actions and it's gonna spit out a probability vector over those actions. So if, if it was just heads or tails, then the set of all probabilities over that is just the set of all P one minus P. That's what we were talking about before. This is just a little bit fancier slash more pedantic way of writing it. So that's a mixed strategy. It reads in an action and it assigns that action a probability. It says, go heads half the time, go tails half the time, right? Play rock. 25% of the time, play paper 50% of the time, play scissors 25% of the time. It just has to be a set of non-negative numbers that add to one. That's all that it is, is choose of, that's just the act of choosing and assigning every action some probability. That's all that we're doing right here. I know it's really annoying looking, but that's all that it is. So, so that's Sigma I. And I'm gonna say that capital Sigma I is the set of all possible lotteries, all the set of all possible mixed strategies. So capital Sigma I is the set of, Instead, that's like, instead of capital A sub I, which was the set of all possible pure strategies, now this is the set of every possible way to mix over heads and tails. Two thirds, one thirds, one half, one half, three quarters, one quarter, one quarter, three quarters, right? One over pi plus one, pi over pi plus one, and so on. All possible probability vectors is capital sigma sub I. That's every possible mixed strategy. And so what a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium is, is a vector of these little sigmas. Everybody's choosing a way to assign probabilities, which might be pure strategies. It might be a bunch of zeros and then a one somewhere. So, so it's just a, a vector of everybody is choosing, instead of choosing an action, now they're choosing a probability to, to play over their actions, right? And so all that we need then, it's the same exact condition. It's just the expected utility of me playing little sigma i against little sigma minus i so my expected utility from the candidate profile, the candidate mixed strategy profile. So my expected utility from playing little sigma i against your little sigma has got to be greater than or equal to than my expected utility for playing sigma i prime, little sigma i prime against your sigma. So I that would be some deviation to some other mixed strategy. And that has to be true for everybody. So it's the same exact condition, it's just an expected utilities instead of utilities. And it's with this mixed strategy profile as opposed to this pure strategy profile, but it's the same idea. It's the same underlying logic is you wouldn't want to change conditional on what everybody else was doing. It's just that what they're doing is a little bit more complicated and what you're doing is potentially a little bit more complicated. So, so let me just show you what I mean by that. So I want to show you that there is no incentive to deviate from this one half, one half equilibrium that we identified in matching pennies. Thankfully, we don't have to check every possible sigma i prime. We don't have to check every possible mixed strategy deviation. All we have to do is check pure strategy deviations. That's a result that you'll never prove, but this is a nice thing to remember. You don't have to check mixed strategy deviations. You only have to check for pure strategy deviations. So let's see what happens. Let's see what the expected utility is for row player right now at the equilibrium profile and if they deviated. So one quarter of the time, they get one point for being in heads heads. And one quarter of the time, they get minus one points for being at heads tails. And one quarter of the time, they get minus one points for being at tails heads. And one quarter of the time, they get one point for being at tails tails. So that all cancels out. Their expected utility at this profile is zero. 
So at the equilibrium probabilities of, of P equals one half and Q equals one half, at that equilibrium mixed strategy profile, the expected utility is zero. What if they had just played heads instead of all this mixing? What if they decided to deviate and say, oh, I don't want to do all this. I'm just going to play heads. Well, if they had just played heads, their expected utility for playing heads is 2Q minus 1. We worked that out before. Well, Q star, the candidate Q right now is 1 half. Well, that's 2 times 1 half is 1 minus they're 0. They're indifferent. This is exactly when they're indifferent. So it, there are no profitable deviations because they're indifferent. At the mixing, at the candidate mixed equilibrium, they're getting zero. If they went heads, they'd get zero. If they just played tails for sure, they'd get zero. They have no profitable deviations conditional on that Q. And likewise for column players. So they don't want to deviate either. This is, a, this is a little bit straightforward in two by two games. You'll see in the C block that there's some nuance to this. So, so that's a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. You just saw your first all the way Mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, you've been taught Nash's theorem, which means that there's always a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. I'll have some more cool theorems to show you in the B block as we work through some more examples. But, but if you can do this, then you should be pretty good for the problem set because it's really just a matter of thinking your way through real careful-like. If you're real careful-like, if you're real deliberate, if you only write down the things that you think are true and then keep your scratch paper in some other room, then you stand a good chance of understanding this because it's just as straightforward as matching pennies. So we need to work through some more examples in the B block. So let's go to the B block. All right. So suppose that we were playing Bakker Stravinsky instead of matching pennies. So suppose that we were playing Bakker Stravinsky. Oh, you beautiful jerks. Look how handsome you are. So this is Bakker Stravinsky. You might remember from last week that Bakker Stravinsky has two pure strategy Nash equilibria, Bach Bach and Stravinsky Stravinsky. Yeah. So you might be, hey, we're done. This is great. Well, if I told you to find all of the equilibria, you wouldn't be done yet. Oh, and it's about to get a little bit more interesting. Bakker Stravinsky is a little bit boring in pure strategies, if you ask me. I think it's a lot more interesting in mixed strategies. So let's just work out these expected utilities. Suppose right now that, that row player played Bach with probability P and column player played Bach with probability Q. And we can just work out those expected utilities real fast. So what's, what's row player's expected utility for going to Bach? Well, that means that Q percent of the time, they're at the Bach concert, they're musical companions, and they get one happiness point. And the rest of the time it's zero. The zeros make life easy. So let's not even write that. So the expected utility of going to Bach for role player is Q. Similarly, the expected utility of going to Stravinsky for row player is two minus two Q. As for column player, the expected utility of going to Bach, well, that means that P percent of the time, with probability P, they're getting those two happiness points. So they get two P. And for going to Stravinsky, well, they get a zero P percent of the time, and then one minus P, they get one. So that's just one minus P. So these expected utilities are a little bit more straightforward. And we can work out when, when either player would rather be at Bach or rather be at Stravinsky or, or when they're indifferent, right? Let's think about row player first. So row player's expected utility of Bach is just Q. And their expected utility of Stravinsky is two minus two Q. So when is Bach strictly better than Stravinsky? Well, Bach is strictly better than Stravinsky, if we work all that out, if Q is strictly greater than or equal to two thirds. So the best response to any Q strictly greater than two thirds is to set P equals to one and say, I'm going to Bach. Similarly, if Q is strictly less than two thirds, then the best thing that row player could do is go to Stravinsky all the time, right? And so the best response to Q strictly less than two thirds is zero. Go to Stravinsky all the time, go to Bach none of the time. And when Q is exactly equal to two thirds, when Q is exactly equal to two thirds, then we wind up in the anything goes. You could choose any P and you would get the same exact utility. Likewise for column player. So here it works out, if we work it out, when is Bach strictly better than Stravinsky? Well, the expected utility of Bach is strictly higher than the expected utility of Stravinsky when P is strictly greater than one third. Right, so, so the best response for 
in response to P for player two for column player is, well, if if P was really high, if P was greater than one third, then go to Bach for sure. That means play set Q equal to one. If if it's less than strictly less than one third, if you think it's unlikely that they go to Bach, then you should go to Stravinsky and set Q equal to zero. And when P is exactly equal to one third, that's when column player is indifferent now. And so that's when they could choose any Q. They're indifferent. So let's visualize this again. Let's put this in a QP space. We're going to draw the best responses. Observe again that the four corners of this square are the four pure strategy profiles, right? So at the, at the origin, at 0, 0, that means the P equals 0 and Q equals 0. That's Stravinsky, Stravinsky. And at 1, 1, that means that they're at Bach, Bach. So we have these four pure strategies or the corners. Let's draw these best response correspondences that we just worked out. Let's do row player first. Let's find the best P in response to the Q's. Well, we just said that if Q is strictly less than two thirds, so I'll mark two thirds on the, on the vertical axis. And if, if, if we're strictly less than two thirds, then, then the optimal P, the best P, the best probability that row player could do is zero, right? So, so I get this whole range from zero up to two thirds. At exactly Q equals two thirds, any P will do. So here's my horizontal line. And if Q is strictly greater than two thirds, then we are only living at P equals one. So that's over here on the P equals one part. So it's jing, jing, jing. Yep. Well, let's think about column player. Well, if P is less than one third, if P is less than one third, then we wind up at Q equals zero. So that's that's down here. That's right on this axis. If P is exactly equal to one third, then any Q will do. So we have a vertical line. And then strictly to the right of one third, for P strictly greater than one third, we end up with Q equals one. Now look, this is a very different looking best response correspondence. Now there are three intersections. Two of them are in keeping with the two pure strategy Nash equilibria that we identified before. The, the, the fact that we have an intersection down here means that Stravinsky, Stravinsky is a Nash equilibrium. And the, the, re, and the fact that we have an intersection up here at 1, 1 means that Bach, Bach is a Nash equilibrium. We knew that. But note also that we have this interior one at 1 thirds, 2 thirds. P equals 1 thirds, Q equals 2 thirds. And it turns out that that is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. It lives in the interior of this square. So there are no pure strategies involved. So this is, this is a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. You may have noticed that in these, in the models like this, we wind up with like horizontal lines and vertical lines only. And the intersections in the interior, the only way for a vertical line and a horizontal line to get intersected and a mixed strategy is for it to be the part where like both players are indifferent. And that's actually a very important part of all this. A necessary condition for mixing over two strategies. If I want to mix over Bach and Stravinsky, the only reason that I would want to mix over Bach and Stravinsky and play some probability that was neither zero nor one, the only reason I would want to mix is if you were mixing in a way that made me indifferent. So in other words, you choose a cue to make me indifferent over my rows. And I choose a P to make you indifferent over your columns. And if I can find such a P and such a Q, then there won't be any reason to deviate because we're indifferent. No matter what I choose, I'm going to get the same exact utility. This, this vertical and horizontal thing means that the only way that there will be an intersection, right? Because it's like, What's best for me is always like this, except for that one flashpoint, right? It's like this, except for the flashpoint. And what's best for you is like this, except for the flashpoint. It's kind of interesting. And here's an interesting result as well. For almost all games, which is to say, if I wrote down a random game, if I just chose all the utility numbers at random, 
the probability that the number of Nash equilibria and pure and mixed strategies is odd, that happens with probability one. It's almost always the case. Any, any randomly chosen game, you can rightfully expect there to be an odd number of equilibria. In matching pennies, there was one equilibrium. In Baka Stravinsky, there's three. Which is to say, if you find yourself landed on an even number of equilibria, zero, two, four, six, you might need to go looking. You might need to go hunting for, for some, some final one to make it an odd number. Now, I can, I can construct games with an even number of equilibria, but they're very rare. They happen with probability zero. So in other words, every model that we wrote down with two pure strategy Nash equilibria, chances are excellent that there's another one lurking there somewhere in the distance. Now, I want to talk about something important and substantive that emerges here in Bakker Stravinsky. Observe that right now, what's happening in this equilibrium is everybody in the mixed equilibrium, in the mixed equilibrium, everybody is going to the show that they prefer two thirds of the time. So I'm going to Bach one third of the time. I prefer Stravinsky. I get two points at Stravinsky if we're together. So I'm going to Stravinsky two thirds of the time and you're going to Bach two thirds of the time. Now we can think out the entire expected utility but it won't be quite as, it won't be a quarter, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. You'll see there's actually going to be some wrinkles here. How often do we wind up in every cell given these probabilities? Well, we end up at Bach, Bach. I play Bach one third of the time. You play Bach two thirds of the time. That means we're in the Bach, Bach cell two ninths of the time. One third times two thirds. How about Bach Stravinsky? Well, I'm going to Bach one third of the time and you're going to Stravinsky one third of the time. That's one ninth. How about down here at Stravinsky Bach? Well, I'm going to Stravinsky two thirds of the time and you're going to Bach two thirds of the time. That's four ninths of the time. And then finally, Stravinsky Stravinsky, I'm going to Stravinsky two thirds of the time. You're going to Stravinsky one third of the time. That's two ninths. So now look at this. In this mixed equilibrium, something very strange is happening. Two ninths of the time we're at Bach Bach and two ninths of the time we're at Stravinsky Stravinsky. So four ninths of the time, we are happy musical companions. Four ninths of the time, we're each at our preferred show, but we're not together. I'm at Stravinsky and you're at Bach. We don't get rewards for that in that game. We need to be together, we're musical companions. So that's it, four ninths of the time. Four ninths of the time in this mixed equilibrium, we're getting nothing. And in fact, it's five ninths because five, one ninth of the time we're up at our least favorite show, separate. So your expected utility, each player's expected utility for this equilibrium, this mixing equilibrium is five ninths. One times two ninths plus two times two ninths. Observe that that is strictly worse than the utilities that you would get from either of the two pure strategy Nash equilibria. You either get one for being together at your least favorite show all the time, or you get two for being together at your favorite show all the time. The, the, the two pure strategy equilibria Pareto dominate the mixed strategy equilibrium. The mixed strategy equilibrium introduces a lot of waste. Five ninths of the time we're not together, but it is egalitarian, right? So my expected utility from the mixed strategy equilibrium is five ninths. And your expected utility from the mixed equilibrium is five ninths. However, at either of the two pure strategy Nash equilibria, we have to create winners and losers. It's either one, two or two, one. So if the role of the state in part is to help us to choose an equilibrium, then we have some options here. We can either incentivize choosing the equilibrium where we mix, which is egalitarian, but wasteful, or we can make a winner. That's efficient, but it's less egalitarian. Which plays out? Who knows? Which should play out? Who knows? But it's an interesting thing to think about. All right, let's think through. Let's think that through again. Let's do another one where we knew that there were pu two pure strategy Nash equilibria and that there might be a third because we think that there, there's usually an odd number. So let's think about chicken. <laughs> so again, you can confirm with asterisks that 
This game has two pure strategy equilibria. The one where I go straight and you swerve, and the one where you go straight and I swerve. Again, that means that if we were choosing an equilibrium through the state or a focal point or some heuristic device, we would be creating a winner and a loser. Right? That's literally a winner and a loser in the game of chicken. So let's work out some expected utility. Suppose that player one uh, swerves with probability P, and suppose that player two swerves with probability P. Well, then that means that the expected utility of swerving, of the expected utility of swerving for row player is, is just Q, and the expected utility of swerving for column player is just Q. The other time you get a zero for being, for being the chicken. However, the expected utility of going straight and as we've written down the game is so for row player, the expected utility of going straight is two times Q plus one minus Q times minus one. So that works out to three Q minus one. And similarly for, for column player, that works out to, to three P minus one. So I just said that the only reason that we'd see mixing is if, you know, this mixing is to render indifferent. So I can just solve and try to find the Q star and the P star that render the players indifferent. So that just means set Q equal to 3Q minus 1 and set P equal to 3P minus 1. Set those expected utilities all equal. And we wind up seeing that P star equals 1 half and Q star equals 1 half. So they go straight half the time and they swerve half the time. And you can work out for yourself that the expected utility for that action profile, for that mixed strategy profile for both players, is one half. There's a minus one and a one that cancel out, there's a zero that ends up not mattering, and it ends up just being two times one quarter, which is one half. So again, we see that there's a, a so that works out for row player and column player. So, so at this mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, one half, P equals one half, Q equals one half. So at that equilibrium, the expected utility for row player is one half and the expected utility for column player is one half. Now in that case, the mixed equilibrium is better than the pure equilibrium where you lose, right? So if one of the equilibria is the, one of the pure strategy equilibria is the one where you win and you get two, and one of the pure strategy equilibria is the one where you lose and you get zero. So here, playing the mixed equilibrium is better an expectation from your standpoint, because at least you get one half, even though it does introduce a one quarter chance of dying. Right? So, so that that's better, but it's still, so there is no Pareto argument going on here, right? There isn't a Pareto argument going on because I can't make one player strictly better off without making another player worse off. It isn't the case that straight swerve or swerve straight Pareto dominate this mixed equilibrium. And again, notice that the mixed equilibrium introduces a very egalitarian outcome, whereas the two pure strategy Nash equilibria introduce far more lopsided, unequal outcomes. So, whether by virtue of norms, heuristics, focal points, or the state, which should we choose? Good luck trying to figure that out. There isn't a right answer. Again, what's cool about game theory is it helps you to see problems. It doesn't solve problems, it makes you see problems in cool ways. So I see we've been working through this pretty slowly, but those three examples I hope should drive home some of these intuitions. A lot of this is more, I, I care much more about the substance of you understanding this mixing thing than I do about whether you're really great at computing mixed strategy Nash equilibria. Mixing is just interesting. Mixing means, okay, let's introduce some possibility for some bad outcomes, outcomes where I wish I could have deviated, but now I'm playing probabilistically. In chicken, there'll be, you know, in chicken, according to this equilibrium, one quarter of the time, the two competitors die in a car crash, right? But that's still optimal for them in a sense. They're willing to eat some of those bad outcomes in order to spread their utility across the outcomes a little bit. So instead of saying, I'm gonna go all in on this one pure strategy outcome, which might be two zero or zero two, instead I'm gonna sort of smooth it. I'm gonna wind up with an expected utility of one half. I'm maximizing my expected utility. I'm choosing the mixing probability that maximizes my expected utility in anticipation of your mixing probability. That's really nuanced and interesting, but it also drives home what we mean by Nash-like behavior. I'm trying to best respond to you and you're trying to best respond to me and now it's just a richer interaction than it was before. So that's, that's what it looks like in the case of two, if it was two players with two strategies apiece. 
We're gonna see moving forward though that this this gets really annoying really fast once we start to introduce nuances. So for that reason, it's probably time for us to move on to the C block. So now suppose we were playing rock, paper, scissors. Imagine what would happen if you played a pure strategy in rock, paper, scissors. Suppose that I was playing paper all the time and you and I were playing rock, paper, scissors and you knew I was gonna play paper because I play pure strategies when I play rock, paper, scissors apparently. So suppose that was happening. Okay, well, if you knew I was gonna do paper, if you knew for sure I was going to play paper, because that's how I roll when I play rock, paper, scissors. Wouldn't you just play scissors? Yeah. But if I knew that you were going to play scissors for sure, why would I be playing paper for sure? Wouldn't I play rock for sure? Yeah. But if you knew I was playing rock for sure, wouldn't you play paper for sure? Yeah. Well, if I knew that you were playing paper for sure, wouldn't I play scissors for sure? Yeah. In other words, there is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium in rock, paper, scissors. It's matching pennies with this zero diagonal. It's just, it's an elaborate matching pennies. It's matching pennies with a tie. So if I just do a simple asterisk analysis, let's just throw the game up there. Oh, I'm never going to get tired of that. You might, but I don't care. There is no pure strategy Nash equilibrium to rock, paper, scissors. But we know that every game... Every finite game, well, this is a finite game. Look, there's two players, that's finite. And each has three alternatives, that's finite. So by Nash's theorem, we know that this game has a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium. So we have to find it. But what does mixing look like when you have three? Well, let's think about this from a role player's perspective. How many different ways could role player mix? We know that they had three ways to play a, a pure strategy. Well, how many ways could they mix over two alternatives? They could mix over rock, paper, they can mix over rock scissors, or they can mix over paper scissors. There are three different ways for them to mix over two alternatives. And there's one way for them to mix over all three, mix over rock, mix over paper, and mix over scissors. And likewise for column player, they can either mix over rock and paper, rock and scissors, or paper and scissors. Well, let's think about how we would compute that. Let's, let's, let's think about all the two versions. So let's see, does there exist does there exist, this is an interesting question, does there exist an equilibrium to this game where both players mix only over rock and paper? Basically, scissors isn't part of the game. What if we were just playing rock, paper? That sounds like a stupid game, but let's play it. Let's just play rock, paper. So as of right now, let's just hold, I'm just gonna fuzz out, I'll just fuzz out the scissors. Uh, fuzz out is not a, as you may have guessed by now, I have no idea what I'm doing. And so fuzz out, there's no way that's a term. All I wanted to do was sleep in and not have to think, and instead here I am fuzzing things out. So if we were just playing over the rock papers, suppose I played rock with probability P and I played paper with probability one minus P. And suppose that you played rock with probability Q and you played paper with probability one minus Q. What would be the candidate mixed strategy Nash equilibrium, right? What would be the candidate equilibrium there? So we're, what we're saying right now is that with probability strictly between zero and one, I'm playing rock, not zero, otherwise it would be a pure strategy on paper, and not one, otherwise it would be a pure strategy on rock. We ruled out all the pure strategies. There will not be any pure strategies played by either player, right? Because if I, if, if I play a pure strategy, you have a unique best response in pure strategies. And we just decided there weren't any pure strategy equilibrium to rock, paper, scissors. Right, so, so there will not be any pure strategies played in any equilibrium. That's a lemma. What's a lemma? A lemma is an intermediate result that you can get out first and then remember it for the rest of the game. So here's a lemma. And the lemma is there will not be any pure strategies in any equilibrium to rock, paper, scissors. And the reason for that is that if I played a pure strategy, you would have a unique best response in pure strategies. If I played rock, you would play paper for sure. There wouldn't be any mixing. If I played paper, you would play scissors for sure. There wouldn't be any mixing. If I played scissors, you would play rock for sure. There wouldn't be any mixing. And we just agree that there, there aren't any pure strategy equilibria, so we only have to consider mixed strategies. So when I say mix over rock and paper, 
I mean P is strictly greater than zero and strictly less than one. There is some actual mixing happening. Okay, well, the expected utility in this little mini game for role player, if they play rock, well, with probability Q, they get zero. And with probability one minus Q, they get minus one because paper beats rock for unexplained reasons. So their expected utility for playing rock in this little mini world is Q minus one. And their expected utility for paper is one times Q, that's just Q, and then there's a zero, so it's just, it's just, it's just Q. So in other words, I, remember, a necessary condition for row player be will, being willing to mix over rock and paper is that they are indifferent between rock and paper. These two expected utilities must be the same. So you tell me, what is some Q out there for which Q equals Q minus one? There is no such Q. So there can't be a, a mixed strategy Nash equilibrium because we just failed the necessary condition test. The only reason that, that row player be willing to mix over rock and paper was if they were indifferent over rock and paper. It has to be a vertical line, right? That doesn't happen. I'm sorry, it has to be a horizontal line. It doesn't happen. So, so that is, we have nothing to worry about there. There is not a potential equilibrium there. What if instead, Row player was mixing over rock and paper, just like before, but column player was mixing over rock and scissors. So suppose that column player played rock with probability Q and played scissors with probability one minus Q. And they played paper with probability zero. I'm just choosing every combination of two-way mixing first. There's a lot of possibilities. My rock paper against your rock paper. My rock paper against your rock scissors. My rock paper against your paper scissors. So that, there's nine possible ways for us to mix over two alternatives together. So now the expected utility for rock, for row player, is Q times zero, right? They still get zero in the rock rock, and one minus Q times one. Now the expected utility for paper has changed. So the expected utility for paper is Q times one, plus one minus Q times minus one, well, that's two Q minus one. Well, now this is all working as it should. So, so row player is indifferent, knowing that there's a rock scissors mixing going on, row player is indifferent if Q equals two thirds. So two thirds of the time it's rock and one thirds of the time it's scissors. All right, that's all working out just great. Let's think about this from column player's perspective now. Well, column player is gonna face the same exact problem that row player had with, with, with being against rock and paper. What about from column player's perspective? Well, column player, if they play rock against this P, then it's P times zero plus one minus T time, one minus P times minus one. So that works out to P minus one. So their expected utility of playing rock is P minus one. And their expected utility of playing scissors, well, it's P times minus one plus one minus P times one. So that's one minus two P. So a necessary condition for being willing to mix over rock and scissors is being indifferent over rock and scissors. So what's the P that does that? That's P equals two thirds. So in other words, we have a candidate mixed strategy Nash equilibrium where both players play rock with probability two thirds. And then row player plays paper with probability one third and column player plays scissors with probability one third. This is a candidate equilibrium. An interesting question is, does either player have an incentive to deviate? Okay, well, let's think about that. So does row player have an incentive to deviate? Well, they're indifferent between every mix over rock and paper. So let's check to see if they have an incentive to deviate against scissors. Right now, they're ex right now row player's expected utility for this current profile is one third. Why? We know their expected utility of rock is one minus Q. And right now the candidate Q star is two thirds, so that leaves one third. So, so their expected utility for this candidate profile is one third for, for row player. It's also one third for column player. So let's see what the expected utility of playing scissors is given what column player is doing in this candidate profile. Well, so if row player deviated the scissors, then they would get two thirds of the time they would get a minus one. So that's minus one times two thirds. 
and then one third of the time they would get zero. So their expected utility right now is minus two thirds. So so row player is very happy with what's happening relative to relative to playing scissors. So they have no incentive to deviate. They have no incentive to deviate to, to rock or paper, and they don't have an incentive to deviate to scissors because that makes things worse. What about column player? Right now, column player's expected utility is one is is one third. What if they deviated to paper for sure? Well, if they deviated to paper for sure, then with probability P, which is two thirds in our candidate profile, they would get one. One times two thirds is two thirds. And with probability one third, they would get zero. So their expected utility would be two thirds. So even though we've satisfied all these equality conditions, column player would rather play paper for sure than play two thirds, one thirds, rock scissors against two thirds, one thirds, rock paper. So this isn't an equilibrium precisely because column player looks at this and says, well, this is all in balance, but I wish I, I, I wish I had played paper for sure given this. If I knew that you were gonna play rock with probability two thirds, I'll play paper for sure and do great. So rock paper against rock paper wasn't an equilibrium. Rock paper against rock scissors isn't an equilibrium. I'm gonna check rock paper against paper scissors and then you could do all the others for column player against row player if you wanted to. This will be enough. I'm sure your heads are already spinning a little bit. We don't do this very often for precisely this reason. It's also true how to compute Nash equilibria is an interesting and ongoing question, both in political science, economics, and in electrical engineering, where it has many applications. So next, let's check to see if rock paper for row player, can we find an equilibrium where, where row player plays rock and paper and column player mixes over paper and scissors. So let's say that column player plays paper with probability Q and scissors with probability one minus Q and never plays rock. So then row player's expected utility for playing rock is minus one times Q plus one times one minus Q is one minus Q. So that's one minus two Q. And for playing paper, well, Q percent of the time they're getting nothing and one minus Q percent of the time they're getting minus one. So that's Q minus one. So the mixing probability that renders row player indifferent between rock and paper is play paper Q percent of the time equals two thirds. So right now, in order for this to be a possible equilibrium, column player must mix their paper two thirds and scissors one third. What about the expected utilities for, for, for column player? Well, uh, the expected utility for paper, with probability P they're getting one, so that's P. And with probability one minus P, they're getting zero. So, so their expected utility for playing paper is just P. And their expected utility for playing scissors is P times minus one, that's minus P, plus one minus P times one, that's one minus P, which is uh, one minus two P. Well, when is one minus two P equal to P is the question. And that's when P equals one third. So right now our candidate equilibrium is row player plays rock one third and plays paper two thirds and, and column player plays paper two thirds and scissors one third. And the question is, does any player have an incentive to deviate? Well, there's no incentive to deviate for row player to anything that is a mix over rock and paper. All we need to check is do they have an incentive to deviate to scissors? Well, if they deviated the scissors, that means their expected utility Q percent of the time they would get one. Well, Q is two thirds. So they would get, they'd bump up to two thirds. So their expected utility for that world would be two thirds. And their expected utility in, from the current profile is one third, just like it was in the last case. So right now their expected utility of the candidate profile is one third and their expected utility if they deviated the scissors is two thirds. So, so row player would like to deviate the scissors. This isn't an equilibrium. So in fact, you can show that there's no way, there is no equilibrium in rock, paper, scissors where the two players are mixing over two. Well, it could be a two against three or a three against two. Let's just skip that. The equilibrium is gonna be, they mix over all three and they mix over all three. Okay, so so let's just work that out. So now, it, now it's gonna be a little bit trickier because I need multiple probabilities, right? So suppose that row player plays rock with probability P1 paper with probability P2, and scissors with probability one minus P1 minus P2. And likewise for column player, suppose column player plays rock with probability Q1, plays paper with probability Q2, 
and play scissors with probability 1 minus Q1 minus Q2. So in order for row player to be willing to mix over rock, paper, and scissors, they must be indifferent between rock, paper, and scissors. So I'm going to end up with two conditions, right? Rock and paper and paper and scissors. So we need to think about player one's expected utility for rock, their expected utility for paper, and their expected utility for scissors. Well, their expected utility for rock is Q1 times zero, which is just zero. It's Q2 times minus one, so it's minus Q2. And then it's one minus Q1 minus Q2 times one. So that's minus Q2 plus one minus Q1 minus Q2. In other words, that's one minus Q1 minus two Q2. Their expected utility for playing paper, well, Q1, with probability Q1, they get one because they played paper against rock. So that's Q1 plus Q2 times zero minus one minus Q1 minus Q2, because that's a minus one, it gets multiplied by. So that's minus one plus Q1 plus Q2 equals two Q1 plus Q2 minus one. Finally, the expected utility of player one for playing scissors is, well, that's Q1 times minus one, so that's minus Q1 plus Q2 times one, so that's Q2, plus z zero, right? So I don't have to worry about the big long one in scissors because it's zero times one minus Q1 minus Q2, so that's just zero. So it's just Q2 minus Q1 or minus Q1 plus Q2. So now I've got three different expected utilities. And what I'm saying to you is, in order for row player to be willing to mix over all three, they have to be indifferent between all three. So these Qs must be chosen in such a way these cues must be chosen in such a way that row player is indifferent between her three alternatives. Well, does there exist such a cue? Notice from the first equation and the third equation that we have to have one minus Q1 minus two Q2 equals minus Q1 plus Q2. So that's a nice tidy equation. There's a minus Q1 on both sides. So I'm just gonna get rid of those. So now I need one minus two Q2 equals Q2. And you can work that out and you'll end up with Q2 equals one third. Similarly, equations two and three tell me that it has to be true that two Q1 plus Q2 minus one equals minus Q1 plus Q2. Same sort of thing. So it's going to be two Q1 plus Q2 minus one equals minus Q1 plus Q2. There's a Q2 on both sides, so I can get rid of them. And you work that out and you get Q1 equals one third. And in the comfort of your own home, you should do the same thing for the P's with, with column player. And you'd find out that the unique mixed strategy equilibrium of this game, the unique equilibrium of this game is for me to mix one third, one third, one third, and for you to mix one third, one third, one third, which is to say, play rock, paper, and scissors randomly with equal probabilities. And you're like, I needed game theory for that? a good point. Well, just think about all the interesting nuances that were involved there. Why you wouldn't just mix over your two favorites or your two least favorites or any two. You couldn't do that because then somebody would have an incentive to deviate on you or you might be selling yourself short. You have to take advantage of the entire strategic space that rock, paper, scissors affords you. You have to take advantage of the fact that there's three outcomes and if you don't use them all equally to your advantage, then you're going to lose. That's nuts. The intuitive answer, the fact that the intuitive answer is the answer to this one is itself magical, right? That's pretty cool. I mean, it's boring and it's cool at the same time. You know, what's interesting about rock, paper, scissors is two things. One, there isn't a pure strategy Nash equilibrium because you can start to talk your way through, but then I would, but then you would, but then I would, but then you would, but then I would, but then you would, then you would across all nine of the profiles. And in the mixing equilibrium, we learn that those things all balance. They all balance in such a way that you wind up just placing uniform probabilities, one third, one third, one third, equal probabilities across all of your possibilities. It's, it's intuitive, it's predictable, but the way that you get there is actually really cool. The journey is way cooler, I think, with rock, paper, scissors. Whereas with Chicken and Bakker Stravinsky, the journey is less cool, but the outcome is cooler. And then with matching pennies, you kind of just have to do it, otherwise you wouldn't have a prediction. Same with rock, paper, scissors. But you don't know which part of the story is going to be the cool part. It might be the way that the model is set up. 
It might be the analysis and the lemmas and all that sort of thing. Or it might be the punchline. It might be the equilibrium themselves. But what's the cool part of any story is is open for debate, but it also, you don't get to know a priori what's going to be cool and what isn't going to be cool. I think that's really interesting in its own right. And I think it speaks to how interesting this, this added wrinkle of mixed strategies is. So today we, we finished our tour of Nash Equilibrium. We, we finished our introduction to Nash Equilibrium. Everything that we do moving forward is going to be some refinement of Nash Equilibrium. It'll be say, it'll be, yeah, this is a Nash Equilibrium and then we have to add something. We need to add some additional conditions. So everything will be a modification of this. This is the, this is the, the basic framework of all of the analysis that we're gonna be doing moving forward. Now, mixed strategies can be real tricky and they can be tedious, and you don't know when it's hard and when it's tedious. Um, a lot of it is just tedium, though, and as you learn more, you won't get that feeling of command that you may have gotten from pure strategy Nash Equilibrium. And it's not that this is harder, it's just that it's less satisfying, uh, because you never quite get to a simple thing. There isn't a one simple way to think about this. You have to, you have to check all these combinations. Rock, paper against rock, paper. Rock, paper against rock, scissors. Rock, paper against paper, scissors. All three against all three. Imagine if there were four alternatives each, or five alternatives each, or ten alternatives each. There's a lot of possibilities. Now, the set of equilibria will always be small with respect to the set of possibilities, but it's still an awful lot to check. So I'd like to conclude with a provocative thought. This mixing that we see. Mixing happens in a lot of different situations, um, from baseball to war to, to children's games. The same logic underneath penalty kicks or throwing a baseball or choosing a tactic for your army. If you're Napoleon and you're choosing a path for your army, all of those options, all of those situations have something in common with matching pennies or rock, paper, scissors or something like that. And it's really remarkable when you think about it that any situation where there's a little bit of nuance in terms of who's gonna do what, that those, those wrinkles end up introducing a lot of possibility for waste. So in, in Chicken, we had to introduce some possibility of the car crash. In Bakker Stravinsky, we had to introduce some possibility of not being at the, at the concert together. And by some possibility, I mean a non-trivial probability. In Bakker Stravinsky, we were apart more than half the time. This introduces questions about whether there's ever actual truly random play. If I were a baseball pitcher, which I'm not, unless I look like Bartolo Colon, but whoever chooses what pitch I throw, whether it's the pitcher, the catcher, or the team's manager, or whatever, they don't have a random number generator, right? They don't toss coins. What they do is they choose a different strategy every time. Now they might choose that probabilistically, they think, but it's very difficult for them to actually say, I'm gonna throw fastball two thirds of the time. Because then there would have to be a time where they felt with on a hunch level that two thirds, that they didn't really wanna throw a fastball. And then the two thirds random number generator would tell them to throw a fastball and then they wouldn't. They wouldn't quite listen to the randomness. The randomness that we introduce when we're making choices to keep our enemy guessing, we have to fully commit to that. You have to say, my choices be damned, I'm feeding all of the agency about what to do to some random number generator that tells me whether it's heads, tails, or a third, a third, a third, or whatever the probabilities are, I need to, I need to equip, I need to invest my decision-making agency into a program. Now, yeah, I choose the probabilities that the program operates under. I say it's a third, a third, a third, and not one half, a quarter, a quarter. I choose the probabilities with complete agency, but then after that, I relinquish control. But we know that people don't do that. We know that people might not always live up to their mixing commitments. Well, this introduces questions about whether mixing is something worth studying at all. After all, it's tempting to think that mixed strategies only came up as a technical workaround so that we could say that we had an equilibrium in all games, including matching pennies and rock, paper, scissors. But that isn't all of it. That isn't all of it at all. So I know many people that think that mixed strategies are just kind of a stupid thing, and they're entitled to that opinion. But 
there's actually another way to see it. And it's something that I'm not going to be able to tell you everything about until we've gotten incomplete information in several weeks. An interesting result is the following. If I have a game like this, where, and I've got an equilibrium that's in mixed strategies, one third, one third, one third, something like that, like rock, paper, scissors, or mixed strategies, Bakker, Stravinsky. If I have those mixed strategies to work with, and those are my equilibria, potentially my only equilibria, somebody might come to me and say, hey, people don't actually play mixed strategies. We only play one game at a time. And many people don't listen to the probability programs that they have to write in order for this all to work. Here's a response. Any mixed strategy equilibrium that I might come up with here is related to a pure strategy equilibrium in a model that's like this, but where you don't quite know my utilities. So in other words, mixed strategy equilibria in a game with perfect information, I know the game, you know the game, you know that I know everything about the game, and I know that you know everything about the game. You know, we all know everything about the game, and then we mix. That mixed equilibrium is related to a pure equilibrium in a world where we didn't quite know everything about each other. So this mixing isn't actually our way of saying, let the probability almighty tell me what to do after I've told the probability almighty what probabilities I want. Instead, it's like saying, I'm gonna do the same thing every time, but you don't quite know which Rob I am. And likewise for you. So in other words, keeping people guessing, it can literally be about keeping people guessing like we have here about what you're gonna do, or it might be keeping people guessing about which you you are. Now, I'm not gonna be able to get into all the details just yet because I haven't introduced all the machine that I will need to show you that result. But it's one of those things that, if this feels like a parlor trick to you right now, if this feels like a magic trick, if right now you're saying this is all a little bit just so, I agree. But there's a lot more to come. And so even though you just learned the foundational thing of game theory, a solution to a broad class of problems about how to make predictions, those solutions are themselves problematic, just like we talked about last week. And that's why we keep pushing. It isn't because we want to get more and more things out of the same machine. It's that we want to see the same machine from many different angles so that we actually come to understand it. And so my concluding thought to you is that I hope that you realize that every time we write down a model that's hard or tedious or both, we're making big commitments about the real world. But those commitments are actually somewhat more fluid the more that we learn. And so if you just keep pushing, if you just keep learning, if you just stick with this for eight more weeks with me, even though you will come to points where you say, this seems kind of stupid, there will always be more until there won't be. And then you'll see the real problems that lie at the bleeding edge of today's understanding about how we all work. You're allowed to have opinions about these things because we're humans and these are objects. And just the same way that I like Kandinsky and you don't, and you like Picasso and I don't, same here. But the more that you learn, the easier it is to see all of the beautiful nuances at work here. So just keep going. And until then, thanks for watching.